I want to welcome you to the second of the John Reed Miller lectures uh, this year, 2020. And the, as I mentioned yesterday, our theme is the pastoral ministry of public worship, leading the congregation in reading, hearing, praying, singing, and seeing the word. Today, we are going to focus on helping the congregation to benefit from preaching. But I, before we even begin, I want to mention one thing left over from the question and answer session yesterday. One good question that was asked that I didn't have a ready answer for are, do you have some recommendations on places that we could go to see examples of uh, reading programs in, in, in public worship for Lord's Day worship. Do you have any examples? And I didn't have one off of the top of my head. And so this morning, I contacted my friend Terry Johnson at the Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah, and he and Josh Espinoza informed me there is a wonderful website of resources for you on all the things that we're actually talking about during this conference. If you go to reformationtoday.org, reformationtoday.org with no punctuation between reformation and today, uh, reformationtoday.org, there are tons of, of resources for leading public worship services in the Reformed tradition. And one of the things on that site is the, um, is the uh, scripture headings for every chapter in the Bible that Terry has written. And the idea is to give a brief description of the content of every chapter of the Bible that could be used in the public service of worship. At the end of that document, uh, you go to the website, you look at a section on the, document, uh, on the website that says for ministers, and, and then you go to those scripture reading uh, headings that he has under the for ministers part of the site. And at the end of that document, there is a six-year Bible reading plan to take you through the whole Bible on Sundays. So that, I, that was such a good question that was asked during the Q&A yesterday. I wanted to make you aware of that resource. By the way, along with that, Terry's book, Leading in Worship. Um, Protestant ministers, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, that is, all of us in the uh, free Protestant church tradition have historically written books like this for the last couple of hundred years, books that are meant to be resources to ministers in doing the ministry of the Word, not just on Sunday mornings in public worship or Sunday evenings in public worship, but in the whole conduct of the ministry. But this one, of course, con uh, uh, concentrates on public worship and gives you many helpful resources for preparing a, a public worship service and for leading a public worship. So Leading in Worship by Terry Johnson. Uh, it's, it's published by Tole Lege Press. I think you can get it on Amazon. I think you can probably get it in our RTS bookstore and elsewhere. Very helpful resource for leading in public worship. And of course, your friend is the Westminster Standards. The, the Westminster Directory for public worship is your friend as a minister preparing a public worship service in the Reformed Protestant tradition. So make sure you have a good copy. The Banner of Truth has a new edition of all of the documents of the assembly that's been completely retypeset, so it's in modern type. My, when I was in seminary, the only version that you could get with all the documents uh, was in very old type style. And uh, though I, ha I read completely through it and marked it up and, and highlighted it and made notes in the margins, the new edition is much easier on your eyes uh, that the banner has produced. And it has all of those documents there, uh, including the directory for family worship, the letter to the reader by Thomas Manton. There is, there is just solid gold in all of those documents, and I commend that to you. Now, back to our focus today, which is on helping the congregation receive the word preached. Or, I might title this, My Sheep Hear My Voice, Teaching Our People How to Listen to Preaching. As I mentioned yesterday, 
uh, many preaching conferences, and, and I'm very thankful for those preaching conferences. I go to them, I benefit from them, I learn from them, I'm encouraged by them. Many preaching conferences focus on how we can preach better. And that's a good thing. Uh, you know, preaching, expository preaching, is much more prevalent in parts of the Reformed evangelical world now than it was, than it was 50 years ago. And that, that's a reason for us to be thankful. But we, we never want to stop trying to get better at what we do in preaching. Uh, I had been at First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi for 13 or so years as the pastor when I got my first sabbatical. And I, I had all these designs on that sabbatical about what I was going to do, and God's main plan for me on that sabbatical, on that sabbatical was to convict me of sin and, and humble me and do some heart work on me. But one of the other things that happened in that sabbatical is I spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about my preaching. And at that time, Derek Thomas, who had been a professor here at RTS Jackson and is now the senior pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina, he was my minister of teaching at First Pres. And our teaching styles were, our preaching styles were very, very different. Um, Derek would focus on a single idea and circle it and circle it and circle it and circle it and drive it deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into people's hearts. And as I look back at my sermon manuscripts from those first um, uh, 13 years, I, I often think, you know, in the three points of my sermon, I probably had three different sermons. And uh, though, the, though the content was biblical and uh, it was good didactically, I, 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 I often thought, boy, I wonder if I came across more like a teacher than a preacher in the messages. And in fact, the, the man that recommended me to be uh, the, the, the minister at First Presbyterian Church, uh, Dr. Paul Long, of the late Dr. Paul Long of RTS Jackson, missions professor, um, actually wrote me a letter about three years into my ministry and saying, you still haven't washed seminary out of your system. Um, and, and you need, he, he pointed out some areas that I needed to grow in as a preacher. And, and let, me, let me pause right there and just say, there's criticism and there's criticism. There's some criticism that discourages you. And that criticism discouraged me. But I went back and I read that letter after my sabbatical and every single word that Paul said was right about uh, that he said. And he didn't mean it to, to, to tear me down. He meant it to help me. He was, a, he was my father. In the, he, he had been a member of Merrill's Marauders in the Second World War. He had done pioneer mission work in the Congo and in Brazil. He was a man's man, and he, he'd tell you things straight. And so you had to kind of brace yourself to hear what he was going to say, but what he said was good. And I went back and I read that year. That letter, when I first got it, really hurt me. When I went back and let it, read it years later, I thought, boy, Paul, every word you said was right. And after my, um, after my sabbatical, many people said to me, Ligon, your preaching has changed. But part of that was reflecting on Derek's preaching and how he was getting to the congregation in his preaching and realizing that I was often giving really good teaching lessons, uh, but I, 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 th I think sometimes I wasn't preaching. And so it's always a good thing for us to want to work on improving our preaching. But this lecture is not on how you can be a better preacher. And we, we have had some amazing uh, lectures like that in the John Reed Miller lectures. Kevin DeYoung's lectures, Sinclair Ferguson's lectures, H.B. Uh, Charles' lectures, um, uh, and uh, Tim Keller's lectures, to name just a few from the last few years, have been incredibly helpful to me in thinking about 
how to preach better and how to engage in, in Christian ministry better. But what I want to concentrate on in this lecture is not how you can preach better, but how you can help your people listen to preaching better. I think in our tradition, we probably concentrate more on how we ought to preach better than on how we help our people benefit from preaching. Because here's the thing, as I mentioned yesterday, no matter how good a preacher you are, there are going to be some people for whom you're, yeah. Doesn't matter how good a preacher you are, you are not going to be some people's cup of tea. So if all you try and do is preach the best you can and you never try to help your people listen to preaching, there will be some people for whom your ministry of the word in the pulpit is meh. So what I want to encourage you to do is don't just think about doing as good a job as you can do in preaching the word. Think about how to help your people listen to your pre preaching and to others' preaching so that they become better hearers of the Word of God. Now, interestingly, the Puritans spent a lot of time on that particular point. They spent a lot of time trying to help their people know and learn to how to listen to preaching. So if you read Richard Baxter's Christian Directory, and I'm going to mention his teaching on this topic a little bit later in this lecture, he has an entire section on helping your people listen to preaching in the Christian Directory. Uh, I'll mention some other sources for you today, but I, I would urge you don't neglect helping your people learn how to listen to preaching because it's a strange thing to do in our day and time. It's stranger than ever before. Uh, I, I remember when I was in uh, college, my uh, history professor, uh, Jim Smart at, the, you know, at Furman University, who, he was the professor of Renaissance and Reformation. That was the, the, the course that covered the, the period prior to and leading up to and during and slightly after the, the era of the Renaissance in Western culture and then the, the Reformation era. It was, a great, it was a great course. And one of the things he told us, uh, talking about the fact that the Reformation came out of a period of time when standard medieval culture below the upper classes was oral culture. And one of the things that changed that, of course, was the invention of movable type. And the reformers took advantage of that. They, they learned how to use movable type in propagating the Reformation. And that's, you know, that's part of what happened with Luther's 95 Theses. He, he, he probably wrote them out, put them up by hand on the church door, and then some enterprising printer got them made copies of it and spread it all over the place. And so what would have been a probably an overlooked local event became a Europe-wide event because of movable type and the printing press and being able to make multiple copies of one document and spread it throughout a region and ultimately throughout the whole of Europe. But at the same time, as movable type was being used to influence the reading masses, much of the other people were an oral culture. And Jim Smart actually described one day that, that um, in Martin Luther's time, a, a German miner, someone who worked in the mines, could come home from working all day in the mines and on his way home pause to hear a street preacher. You know, someone like Tetzel or, or one of the other street preachers in medieval, uh, late medieval, early modern Germany and maybe listen to that street preacher for a half hour or 45 minutes, and then that, that German miner would be able to go home, sit down with his wife and family at the meal, and repeat verbatim 
the sermon that he had heard. Why? Because it was, an, it was a dominantly oral culture. So, the, the, the hearing of God's word would have been a different experience for people hearing preaching in that culture than in our culture. We, we're a culture that has been in, inundated by screens and almost all of us have ADHD when it comes to concentrating on long verbal discourses, right? We, you know, our, our minds wander very easily. We, we, you know, we can be listening intently to something for five minutes and it's like squirrel and, and, and then we're, we're off, we're off on, a, on, a, on a tangent because we're so used to, you know, 200 and... 80 characters on Twitter or uh, very, very brief interruptive things happening to us all day long while we're awake. And so we're preaching in a very different day and time than the reformers were. And because of that, for a lot of our people, listening to sermons can be a strange thing. It may be the only thing they do like that unless they're university students. It may be the only thing they do like that in any given week. Even in the business culture, where, where longer addresses and lectures used to be a part of Harvard Business School or things like that, it's, everything there has gone the, the way of TED Talks. So, you know, it's, it's now 12-minute talks, and there, there's, you know, high video content and things of this nature. So we're, we're preaching in a very different environment, we not only want to be good at what we do, we want to help our people be able to appreciate what we're doing better. So let me ask you to turn to John 10, 27. And then I want to, I want to turn to three other passages very briefly, and then I want to talk with you about helping the congregation to receive the word preached or teaching our people how to listen to preaching. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And then Matthew chapter 11, verse 15, and this is one of seven passages in the Gospels where these words are said. Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he says that seven times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. And Jesus says this seven times in the book of Revelation, in the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2, verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul says to the congregation there, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Amen. And thus ends these readings of the holy, inspired, and inerrant word of God. May he add his blessing to them. Preaching is God's prime appointed instrument to build up his church. And that is why it is so important that we preach the scriptures in public worship. It is how God has appointed his church to be built up.
The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 17, that faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And that is why it is so important that we preach the Word of God so that Jesus' sheep hear His voice, so that those who have ears hear, so that those who have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, so that what they hear from us they will receive not as the words of men, but what it really is, the Word of God, which performs in them uh, who believe. And so faithful biblical preaching is God's prime appointed instrument to build up His church. It is designed to explain and apply Scripture to the gathered company, believers and unbelievers alike. And we should always remember, even if we are preaching in a godly Christian congregation, that not not all under our ministry believe. So we should always be preaching to believers and unbelievers alike when we preach the Word of God. Uh, By the way, that's something I think that the ministry of Tim Keller has been so helpful in. Remember that you're preaching to unbelievers. Don't forget that you're preaching to unbelievers. But that's not a new insight. Uh, James Durham, uh, a a contemporary of the uh, documents of the Westminster Assembly, puts it this way. This is the great design of all preaching to bring them within the covenant who are without. In other words, to convert unbelievers, to to bring those within the covenant who are outside of the covenant, and to make those who are within the covenant to walk suitably to it. And as these are never separated on the Lord's side, so they should never be separated on our side. In other words, you should never, ever separate evangelism and edification in preaching. You need to always be doing both at the same time, evangelism and edification. Now, my personal temptation, I'll just tell you, my personal temptation has been skewed towards edification. And so I I need the reminder of brothers that are faithful in evangelistic preaching saying in my ears, Lig, don't forget evangelism in your preaching. Not just edification, not just comfort, not just assurance, not just helping people in their Christian life, not just promoting sanctification, not just giving hope in a hopeless world, but also evangelism. I love the way that Sinclair Ferguson describes the ministry of John Owen. Uh, you know, if you know anything about Sinclair, he did his PhD on Owen. Uh, he, he, he has done a lot of reflection on Owen's uh, teaching on communion with God and what that means for pastoral ministry. And uh, here, here's how he sums up Owen's approach to preaching. He says, in preaching, Owen wanted those who are not in union with Christ to know that they are not in union with Christ. And for those who are in union with Christ to know that they are in union with Christ. Isn't that a striking way of trying? Now, what that is, is it's evangelism and edification, right? Because you can't, someone's not ready to hear the gospel if they don't know that they need the gospel. So in preaching, he wants to make sure that those who are not in union with Christ know that they are not in union with Christ. So that they know that they need to be in union with Christ. That's evangelism. And then edification is, and then for those who are in union with Christ, to know that they are in union with Christ and all that that entails. It's a beautiful way of describing it. 
but our preaching needs to be both expository, edificational, and evangelistic, squarely based on the text of the Word of God, always keeping in mind believers and unbelievers, expounding the Scriptures with a view to evangelism and edification. Now, people who appreciate the Bible's teaching on worship will have a high view of preaching. Preaching is not a personality-driven, theologically void, superficially practical monologue. No, from the very beginning, the sermon was supposed to be an explanation of Scripture. From the very beginning, the sermon was supposed to be an explanation of Scripture. Hughes Old says this, It is not just a lecture on some religious subject. It is rather an explanation of a passage of Scripture. Preach the Word. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. So what is it we're to preach? Preach the Word, the Word of God. The Word of God is to be the subject of our preaching. It is to be the source of our preaching. It is to be the content of our preaching. Preaching is not a lecture on a religious subject. It's an explanation of a passage of Scripture. And so, expository, sequential, verse by verse, book by book, preaching through the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God, as it's called in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, was the practice of many of the church fathers, Chrysostom, Augustine, others, all the magisterial reformers, and many of their best heirs ever since. The preached word, Hughes Old says, the preached word is the central feature of Reformed worship. So how do you help your people listen better to the preached word? Well, the Westminster Larger Catechism actually has some help for you in this area. As I've been saying to you, the confession and its documents are your friends. The assembly and the and um, and its documents are your friends. By the way, Chad Van Dixhorn uh, argues that one effect of the work of the Westminster Sim Assembly was to bring about the greatest reformation of preaching in Britain ever. In other words, he, he argues that the Westminster Assembly had a greater effect on preaching in Britain than the Reformation did. Uh, and it's, it's quite remarkable. You need, to read, uh, you need to read Van Dixhorn on that subject if you haven't, uh, because I, I think he's right. And here's what Larger Catechism 159 and 160 say. How is the word to be preached by those that are called thereunto? And it answers, they that are called to labor in the ministry of the word are to preach sound doctrine diligently in season and out of season plainly not in the enticing words of man's wisdom but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power faithfully making known the whole counsel of God wisely applying themselves to the necessities and capacities of their hearers, zealously, with fervent love to God and the souls of his people, sincerely aiming at his glory and their conversion, edification, and salvation. Now that's a, that's a wonderful description of how we ought to aspire to preach. And it would be a wonderful thing for you to meditate upon from time to time. I, I, one of the things I do from time to time is meditate on my ordination vows. 
uh, you know, and there's, there's this wonderful vow where you say, you know, in, in so far as you know your own heart, have you pursued this ministry for the glory of God and the good of his people? And that's a, you, know, you have to sit down and say, why, why am I doing what am I doing? You know, am I doing this because I want to get paid? Uh, am I doing this because what it does for me? Or am I doing this for the glory of God and the good of his people. Another good thing is to go to the larger Catechism 159 and ask yourself, is this how I'm preaching? Is this why I preach? Is this what I'm after? Is this my motivation and my goal in preaching? But you could also explain to the people of God what you're trying to do in preaching. Just Tell, just let me level with you what I'm trying to do when I preach. And then larger catechism 160 says, what is required of those that hear the word preached? Now we're more closely on the subject of this lecture and here's the answer. It is required of those that hear the word preached that they in, attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. So the first thing is they need to attend on it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. It, in other words, benefiting from preaching requires active listening. You, you need to attend to it, prepare for it, and pray for it. So there's the first thing. They need to attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Secondly, examine what they hear by the scriptures. The, the Bereans, you remember in the book of Acts, tested what they heard according to the scriptures. Well, we ought to also hear what is preached and examine it according to the scriptures. Is this faithful to what the Bible teaches? Which, of course, requires you to know what the Bible teaches, which requires you to read the Bible and study the Bible. So there's the second thing that the standards say. Examine what they hear by the scriptures. Third, receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, readiness of mind as the Word of God. Now let's park on that for a second. We're to receive the truth with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the Word of God. So there is a certain posture in which we should receive faithful preaching. First of all, we're to receive the truth with faith. We're to believe what God says is true. We're to trust what God tells us to trust. We're to do what he tells us to do. Uh, we're to think how he tells us to think. We're to receive it with faith. We're also to receive it with love. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? We're to receive the truth with love. Certainly, that at least means love to God. You know, when, when, if you had a good relationship with your earthly father and he told you something important, one of the ways that that important thing goes down into your heart is because you know that he loves you and you love him. And, and because of that, it goes down into your heart. I, I, there, my father has been dead for... 28 years now and I there are still things that my father said to me that I remember why because I knew that he loved me and I loved him so you're to receive the word of God with love because your heavenly father loves you it is his word of love to you and you're to receive it with love to him this also may indicate we're to receive it with love to the brethren as well 
but that we'll come back to that in a moment. We're to receive it with meekness or humility. I mentioned yesterday uh, David Pallison's phrase, the but what abouts. When you start arguing with God about things that you don't like in the Bible. By, by the way, that, there, there's a sense in which that's a good sign. Uh, people, the people that worry me are the, are the people that make the Bible conform to their preconceived ideas and notions. I'm a little more encouraged when people start arguing with things that the Bible says because at least they recognize that the Bible doesn't say what they think. And so if you've, if you've managed to read the Bible in such a way that it conforms to your preconceived notions, you may be reading your preconceived notions into the Bible. And when you find yourself arguing the Bible, at least you, you're at the point where you realize the Bible doesn't think like you. Or to put it another way, God doesn't think like you. Uh, but it's arrogant, isn't it? Prideful, isn't it? To place your opinion over God's. So to, to really listen to the Word of God, you need to listen with meekness, with humility. To, to realize that God knows best. And that when I find myself disagreeing with the Bible, I know who's wrong. And it's not the Bible. I, I'm the one that's wrong. Not the Bible. And it is not only to be read with meekness, but with readiness of mind. Uh, you, you, are, you, you are desirous of receiving what it is that the Word of God is saying to you. Receiving it with faith, love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the Word of God. So that's the third thing that the, short, short, uh, the larger catechism says that we are to do in receiving the Word preached. And then, fourth... How, what is required of those that hear the word preached? To meditate and confer of it. To meditate and confer of it. If you study the Bible, you need to meditate on it, to reflect on it, to, to, to try and think deeply about what it says and what it means and what that means for you and what that means for for others, what that means for the church, what that means for the world, what that means for how you live. You, you need to meditate upon it. And then you need to confer of it. Um, it. It was a common spiritual practice amongst Scottish Presbyterian Bible-believing ministers in the 20th century and in the 19th century to frequently talk with one another about biblical truth that they were meditating upon. And uh, when, when I was in Scotland, uh, the phrase that I heard that, that often started those kinds of conversations, I heard from Eric Alexander, and, and Eric would say something like this, Ligon, where have you been grazing? Now what Eric was asking me was, Ligon, where in the Bible have you been reading and meditating and reflecting? Share that with me and let's talk a little bit about what you have been learning. Uh, when uh, Bob Kara and I were examining Sinclair Ferguson to become a chancellor's professor at Reformed Theological Seminary, we had a three-hour interview that, like we do with every single professor uh, who is called to be on the faculty of RTS. And that examination, that theological examination, frankly, was more like a worship service. And during the examination, at one point, Sinclair Ferguson said, John 10, 27 has been controlling for my ministry. And then what he did is he began to reflect on, 
on his meditation uh, out loud on what my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me had meant for his a whole approach to pastoral ministry. And it was a rich meditation and reflection as we conferred on that together. It was, it was like a worship service. And the Scottish ministers that I encountered in, in the 1980s in Scotland did that regularly with one another. They ask one another, where have you been grazing? What biblical truth have you been meditating upon? Let's talk about that together. And so th th that's one way that we hear the word of God better. Fifth, hide it in their hearts and bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. What is required of those that hear the word preached? They hide it in their hearts and they bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. At the very least, that means there's some memorization going on, right? You're going to hide the word in your heart. There are certain words of scripture, hopefully a lot of it, that gets hidden in your heart. You memorize it, you store it up in your heart. Mary treasured those things in her heart that the angel had spoken and all of the people of God ought to want to treasure God's word to them because it is no less God's word to them than the angel's words were God's words to Mary. Treasure them in our hearts and then what? Bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. So we, we never want to be satisfied with simply being hearers of the word how does jesus finish the sermon on the mount be hearers and doers of the word we want to be hearers and doers of the word or how does he put it in the great commission uh, go make disciples teaching them to obey all that i have commanded notice go make disciples teaching them to hear what I have said. No, teaching them to do what I have said. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. So we don't just want to be people with big fat heads and tiny little hands and feet. We want to know so that we bring forth fruit in life. So we want our knowing and our desiring and our acting to go all together in the Christian life. So those are five things that the Westminster Larger Catechism question number 160 suggests to you as ways that you can help your congregation benefit from the preaching of the word better. But let me add to those a few more things. And the first thing is simply this. Teach your congregation what a sermon is and what it is for. Teach your congregation what a sermon is and what it is for. Now, there are, there are different definitions that you can give for a sermon. And, and, and all of those definitions would have strengths and weaknesses and uh, would be helpful in different ways. Just like there are different definitions that you can give for the word covenant, there are different definitions that you can give for the word sermon, and they bring out different aspects of what a sermon is. But explain to your people what a sermon is and what it is for. I've always loved J.I. Packer's definition or maybe it's a description of what a sermon is in his book truth and power it's in a chapter i think the chapter is something like mouthpiece of god or mouthpiece of the lord or something like that i can't even remember which chapter it is but in that chapter packer gives this description or definition of a sermon he says a sermon is an applicatory declaration <clears throat> 
spoken in God's name and for his praise, in which some part of the written word of God delivers through the preacher some part of its message about God and godliness in relation to those whom the preacher addresses. Wow! Now there's a homiletics class in in that one definition right there. And it's not the only definition of preaching, but it's, it's always meant a lot to me. And so let me just break it down for you uh, for a minute, because I think you, your people need to understand this. First of all, a sermon is an applicatory declaration. So in preaching, we are not simply informing people. We are not simply informing people. A, a lot of people will accuse preaching and teaching and lecturing of being an act of information transfer. But the minister is always concerned that there will be a spiritual effect of what he is doing in that declaration. It's an applicatory declaration. It's not simply information transfer. He wants your life to change. So Packer starts off, a sermon is an applicatory declaration. It's, it's a declaration of truth that is meant to be applied to the life of believers. It's meant to bring about spiritual renovation and transformation. It's to have an effect upon the character and the life of the hearers. It's an applicatory declaration. Second, it is spoken in God's name and for his praise. I think this is something for us to be clear on. When we preach, we must explicitly preach for the glory of God. We want God to be made much of in the hearts and lives of our hearers. We want God to be glorified. Just as the chief end of man is to glorify God, so also the chief end of preaching is to glorify God. So we want God to be made much of, and we speak, when we preach, we speak in God's name. We are not there to bring our ideas. Just like the Old Testament prophets had the word of God put in their mouths so that they would out of their mouths speak the word of the Lord, so also we are to speak in God's name, not our own. Third, Packer says, a sermon is an applicatory declaration spoken in God's name and for his praise in which some part of the written word of God. Pause. It's based on the text of Scripture. You can't preach the whole Bible, usually, in one sermon. So you have to pick part of the Bible for the text of the message. So in preaching, some part of the written word of God is explained, is declared, is applied. And then I love this next phrase. In which some part of the written word of God delivers through the preacher. Pause. Very often we think of the preacher using the word of God for the spiritual benefit of the flock. Packer says here, the Word of God uses the preacher's preaching of the Word of God for the spiritual benefit of the flock. In other words, you are the tool of the written Word of God. The written Word of God is not your tool. You are the tool of the written Word of God. The written Word of God is is not your tool. Now, very frankly, you, you hear many preachers use the written word of God as a tool. It is the excuse for them to talk about what they want to talk about. And I, this part of the definition is solid gold. If you could remember every time you preach, all I am is the tool of the written word of God. 
The agenda that I'm up here for is God's agenda. The content that I'm up here to deliver is God's content. The aims and goals that I'm up here for are God's aims and goals. My opinions, my preferences, my ideas, this is not the place for that. I am a tool of the written word of God. And the written word of God is going to use me to deliver the message that he wants to deliver to his people. I am simply the mouthpiece of the Lord. That's what I am. In which some part of the written word of God delivers through the preacher some part of its message. You don't have to give the entire message of the word of God in every sermon. Some part of its message is going to be delivered through the preacher. And then I love how Packer sums it up about God and godliness. Really, you can divide the whole Bible is divided into two parts. It's about God and godliness. The whole Bible is about God and godliness. It's about, it's about God and walking with God. It's about God and communion with God. It's about God and living with God. That's what the Bible's about. It's about God and godliness. And then he goes on to say, in relation to those whom the preacher addresses. So you, you are bearing in mind who you are addressing when you preach the message. You're bringing to bear on them the message of the written word of God. So you do, you, it, it is important to know your congregation. It is important for you to know what they're facing. It is important for you to know what they're up against or up to. But you're bringing God's message to them, not yours. And you are the tool of the scripture. The scripture is not your tool. Now, I love that. Now, if you understand that definition, I think what Packer is saying is this. If you are a faithful preacher, you are simply facilitating a word-mediated encounter between your people and the living God. In your preaching, you are facilitating a word-mediated encounter between your people and the living God. You are not the mediator. Jesus is the mediator. And he mediates the presence of God and, and uh, their encounter with God by the word. The word is that which mediates, not you. You're just the facilitator. You're facilitating a word-mediated encounter with the living God. So explain to your people what you're trying to do. You know, when, when I'm up here on Sunday morning, brothers and sisters, when I'm up here on Sunday evening, brothers and sisters, I want your souls to hear the word of God speak to them. I want your souls to hear God himself speak his word to you. And in order to do that, what I have to do is study to make sure I know what God says in his word and I need to know enough and have enough experience in life to know how that word applies to me and how I am to live out that word so that I bring to bear that word on your lives. Because the goal is for you to commune with God, for you to hear God speak, for your souls to do business with God. That's what's supposed to, do, to happen here in this message. So all I'm doing is facilitating a word-mediated encounter with the living God. So one way that you can help your people appreciate preaching is simply to tell them what a sermon is. Second, you need to teach them why it's important. You need to teach them why the sermon is important. It is a matter of life and death. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. They need to understand that they need to listen as if their lives depend upon it because their lives depend upon it. 
Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's a life and death thing. Have you ever been on an airplane and the flight attendant starts saying, please make certain your seat belts are securely fastened, your seat backs are in their full upright position, and your tray table stowed? Your carry-on luggage should be placed beneath the seat in front of you and the overhead bins, and by that time you're... But if four minutes later that plane plunged thousands of feet, you would be trying with every bit of the wits that you could gather to remember what it was that that flight attendant told you to do. That's like a sermon, my friends. But it's very easy to go to sleep spiritually in that sermon and not hear the word that you need the most. A, a, a famous Presbyterian pastor, Glenn Connect, used to say, the sermon you miss is the sermon you need. But we, we have operatives sometimes in uh, our lives, what uh, Jim Stewart used to call church sleep. Church sleep, he said, is when you think you're awake, but you're not. And a lot of people church sleep through sermons. They think they're listening, but they're not. And you need to explain to people why it's so important that they listen to God's word, because their lives depend upon it. Third, Teach your people who it is that's talking to them. It's not their pastor. It's not even their beloved pastor. It's not even the pastor that they, they, they love his preaching. It's God speaking to them. They need to listen because this is God talking to them. It's all about the message, not about the messenger. When, when, the, when the postman brings you mail from your loved ones, you're not excited about the postman. You're excited about the letter from your loved ones. And that's all you are is the preacher. You're the postman. You're delivering the mail. The big thing is the mail is from God. So you, you need to teach your people. It's not your pastor who you love that you're listening to. It's the God who loves you, who has commissioned the pastor that you love to talk to you about him with words from him to you. So listen like it's your God talking to you. It's about the message of God's word, not about the messenger who delivers God's word. Fourth, remember what the Bible is all about. And remember what life is all about. It's about God and godliness. It's about glorifying and enjoying him forever. And thus, Look for everything the Bible is teaching you about God and your purpose in life to pursue His glory and your joy in Him. The Bible is about that. You know, there, there's so many people in our day and age that are experiencing identity crisis. They don't know who they are. And there's so many people in our day that are experiencing purpose crises. They don't know why they're here. And guess what? The Bible tells you both those things. It tells you who God is. It tells you who you are. It tells you what you're here for. Teach your people what the Bible is all about and what life is all about and why the Bible speaks to what life is all about. And then finally, teach your people to remember who they are. If they're believers, they are both sinners and children of God. If they're unbelievers, they're just sinners <laughs> created in the image of God. Teach your people to remember who they are. They're either sinners and a child of God, or they're sinners created in the image of God. And they deeply need God's remedy for sin to know his grace and to hear his assurance. And the message of the preaching of the word of God is meant to address those things every time we open our mouths. Now Richard Baxter, as I said, uh, in 1673 in his Christian directory gave numerous directions for uh, helping the congregation listen to preaching. And I'm not going to read 
those directions because they number uh, over 50 directions to the congregation uh, in how they're to prepare to listen to the preaching. But he gave four categories that the preacher ought to help people with as they come to preaching. And here are those categories. First, he says, if you're going to listen to the Word of God, you need to hear with understanding, remember what you hear, be rightly affected by it. And, and that word affected doesn't mean just to emote, so you're emotionally touched by it. It means to be influenced or changed or stirred or impressed with a particular truth. So you need to hear with understanding, remember what you hear, be rightly affected by it, and sincerely practice it. And he gives a 50 directions on how to help your congregation in those areas. Now, there are some great resources that have recently been written on this topic. Jay Adams wrote a little book called Be Careful How You Listen, How to Get the Most Out of a Sermon. Ken Ramey wrote a little book called Expository Listening, a practical handbook for hearing and doing God's Word. Joel Beakey has written a little book called The Family at Church, Listening to Sermons and Attending Prayer Meetings, all of which give you ideas as a pastor for how you can help your people listen to sermons. But let me just close with these five practical suggestions. One, preach a series on how to listen to preaching. Two, Make brief pre-service reminders and encouragements on that topic. Three, emphasize the importance of reading and preaching the word in your public worship services. Four, put helpful quotes in your bulletin. And fifth, Publish your bulletin online and encourage your congregation to read the sermon passage ahead of time. Thank you very much.